Um, so delighted to be here today. Um, uh, many thanks for the, the invitation to speak to you all. Um, it's quite humbling when you actually see a patient give testimony about uh, the care that's given. And that's real quality of care. You know, it makes a big difference to that patient. But I think one of the problems that we have is actually in some way relaying that to the wider healthcare community. <coughs> Nowadays, it's not enough just to say, listen, we know we do a good job. We can't really define what it is that we do. We just know we do it well. Unfortunately, that just doesn't work anymore. And if you're looking to try and protect models and advance models and develop services, you need to be able to in some way demonstrate what it is that we do. So the title of my talk today is Evidence-Based Service Development, Using Metrics to Drive Better Patient Outcomes. So I'm just gonna start by asking, what does quality in palliative care actually mean? I think we saw an example of it there. But when you mention quality to a room of healthcare professionals, it's like a cue for them to go to sleep. It's like a cue to become bored. And most people immediately disengage. And the reason for that is, is that the reason I get up in the morning, a lot of you get up in the morning, is not to engage with quality. It's to look after patients, because that's what we want to do, and that's what we do well. But it's actually quite interesting when you look at quality as we know it, where it all came from. It all came from the NHS in the UK, which is established back in the 1940s with a minimal focus on any quality structures at all, because it was actually assumed that if there's good people working in a service, that there would be therefore good quality within a service. In the 50s and 60s then, thereafter, any quality improvement drives really focused on uh, structural aspects of healthcare. So things like having enough hospitals, having enough beds, having enough x-ray machines, those type of things. And then in the 70s and 80s, analysts began to cop on a little bit that there might be a little bit more to this than meets, meets the eye. So they actually started looking at the private sector and what they were looking at and things like the automotive community, etc. And they started looking at criteria and standards and norms. Then the 90s happened, which was an interesting time for some of us. And <laughs> around that time, uh, clinical governance became established in the UK. And this is the framework through which organizations are accountable for continually improving the quality of their care and, or, and, and safeguarding high standards of care by creating an environment in which clinical excellence can flourish. So that's the definition of uh, <laughs> clinical governance. So there's three main things here. First of all, is that there's high standards of care. That means you have to be able to identify the standards, define them, and then be able to measure them. Organizations would have transparent responsibility for this, and also they will be accountable for meeting those standards uh, and show a commitment to continuous quality improvement. So they're the guiding principles of clinical governance. More accurately, if you have good corporate governance and good clinical governance, that would assure that you would have a good quality of systems within the service and the organization, and this would ensure quality of patient outcomes, very much like what Norma was saying, the Donvidian model of structure, process, and outcome. But more importantly, where people got a bit afraid is that they were now accountable for meeting these measures. And that means you have to, first of all, have measures because you can't manage what you can't measure, as they say. And standards were created by uh, NICE in the UK, which meant that services then could be benchmarked <laughs> over time against each other. Uh, or with each other, I think is the better way of saying it. Uh, and this was called assuring quality, so they flipped it around and called it quality assurance. Uh, and then these new terms started entering the quality domain, things like continuous quality improvement, which is really kind of a prospective audit cycle, and total quality management, which means you manage everything. If you look at the quality journey so far, and this is very much like what Norma's slide was a, a few minutes ago, we had the, the seminal article, our seminal doc document in, in Ireland in 2001 with Tony O'Brien, the National Advisory Report, which uh, advocated the hub and spoke model uh, for, for palliative care with day centres and, and home care and inpatient beds. And then over time, as was on Norma's slide, the HICWA and the HSE have produced guidelines on how to develop these things called key performance indicators. Most people don't really know what that is. It's kind of out there. It's just like a KPI. And because it's not really defined, everything's a KPI. Well, it's not. Um, and then you have the national, uh, the HICWA standards for safer and better healthcare, 
And then we had a large amount of work with Karen Ryan in the clinical program, the QA and I workbooks, which really helped interpret these standards. We had the balanced scorecard, uh, we had the palliative care competency framework, and then we had some, uh, through the clinical program, we had some outstanding national uh, clinical guidelines. Uh, sorry, I have to say that. <laughs> but during that time, uh, we've also, I, I, there's also been an enormous amount of uh, measures produced internationally. Like, I only put a few documents on here, but when I actually did a literature review on this four years ago, at that stage, there was more than 500, I stopped counting at that stage. And most of these are actually developed with no evidence base, it's just an idea by people talking. I think what's good about that is, it's not good that there's no evidence, but it does show that people are looking at this more and there's a reason why they're doing that. Also, we've had the HSC corporate plan and the palliative care three-year development framework. So a lot of these documents out there for driving service, uh, for service quality. But I think the big question is, is, when you're looking at all these documents, another document comes down and say, good God, who's gonna pay for all this? Okay, because clearly resources are a problem at the moment uh, everywhere in every country, but in our country especially. And if we're talking about service development, trying to develop our model of care, uh, I think one of the big challenges we have is actually maintaining services as they, as they are. And it's a very challenging environment out there for uh, in healthcare with different clinical programs and different models of care vying for limited resources. So I think we really have to try and make a strong case uh, for the palliative care model in Ireland to try and, and, and protect and develop our model. I also think traditionally there's been difficulty because there's been a dissociation between the metrics that have been out there and their usefulness in guiding service development. So what I actually think we need is we do need from a service perspective to enable the care that that man got. We need to be able to show some metrics that look at cost, look at the service impact of what we do. So I'm looking at things like uh, presentations to outpatient clinics, uh, presentations to A&E, uh, how, how do we actually affect the overall occupancy of beds within the, the hospital service, patient benefits, of course, you have to look at those, clinical efficiency, and also show a commitment to continuous quality improvement. They're vital that we're able to show that in any model going into the future. So what we have to do to use the quality jargon is to build an outstanding case for a model that is low capital and revenue cost, one that displays clinical effectiveness. And what clinical effectiveness basically means is, are we effective at doing what we say we do? Do we actually improve pain? Do we improve suffering? Do we improve family and care outcomes? That type of thing. Um, a case that will, for a model that shows clinical efficiency, one that actually reflects the service that we, that we give, shows our effect on bed occupancy in the, in the bigger service, and shows patient benefits, it's vital, that has to be done, and shows a commitment, continuous quality improvement. We have to show that we're committed to improving our service on a continuous basis, and we have to prove it. And in the Irish healthcare system, we have to do all this for free, okay? I think it's important to remember at this stage, right? Nothing's perfect, and no model is perfect. And there's faults in every model. So any model that's out there, you can immediately go, that's wrong. Before, you know, that's not right, it's not perfect. But what we're trying to do is find a model that's the best fit. And then we can work on that and refine it over time and try and move towards a better model. So nothing's perfect at the start. So what can we do? Well, what we, I suppose, in the bigger, bigger picture I've been looking to do over the last 10 years and what we need to continue to do is demonstrate the benefits of that full model um, of uh, palliative care with useful metrics. So we need to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of a full model of care versus uh, a standard care without inpatient beds and that. We need to demonstrate the service benefits, the overall service benefits of a full model of care versus if we weren't there. And we have to, of course, demonstrate the patient benefits, that's vital. And we have to demonstrate this commitment to continuous quality improvement. And we have to display it and prove it and show it on a continuing basis. So going back to, to money, we know from, there's been a lot of studies done in the last 10 years, an enormous amount actually, um, on the costing of palliative care. And I remember talking about this and looking through about 10 years ago, I could find nothing on it. In the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of studies into this. So what we do know 
uh, from recent studies is that hospital-based palliative care interventions reduce hospital care costs. They do, it's proven. Healthcare costs are much higher in the last year of life, as you'd expect, and they increase exponentially in the last three months of life, again, as you would uh, expect. And there's increasing evidence being produced all the time with larger studies that palliative care programs when integrated into national, regional, and local programs lead to significant reduction in costs at the end of life. Now, we're looking at a language that management in, in the HSE and the government you know, like to hear, saving money. That's not why we do, but that's what we're doing. Now, I'm not asking you to read this slide. I'm going to slowly go through this slide now with you. Um, now, so I'm just going to highlight one or two points because there's a lot of literature and someone has actually done a literature review for us, so we don't have to go into this. But just one point, a couple of points. In Spain, in Catalonia, if palliative care is involved in the last month of life, the patients are admitted to the hospital 16% of the time versus 63% of the time if palliative care were not involved. That's an enormous difference. In the Edmonton Palliative Care Program in Canada, the addition of a fully resourced, so the addition, not the substitution, the addition of a fully resourced hospital-led, um, hospital consultant-led palliative care program uh, made annual savings $1.6 million to the service. And that was in the addition of it, it wasn't instead of. And another study in Barcelona that showed that patients with a life-limiting illness, if palliative care were involved, uh, the, um, it reduced hospital expenditure by 61% in those patients. So these aren't, in, these aren't small differences. These are monumental differences in cost. And there's other American ones. But the reason I'm not going into them all, which is, is intensely boring, but apart from that, is that uh, Aoife Brick and Charles Normand and Samantha Smith in the research silo from Trinity did a, um, a uh, literature review and they found that palliative care is most frequently found to be less costly relative to comparative groups. And in most cases, the difference in cost is statistically significant. So they found 46 papers that were of a high quality, did a literature review, and that's what the evidence shows. Further on from that, with more of that project, uh, people remember um, the palliative care economic evaluation a number of years ago. Uh, Aoife Brick and Charles Norman for the ESRI um, looked at a number of services and compared them and contrasted them. So they looked at a fully resourced palliative care service, it was actually our service in Milford, with an inpatient unit um, and community palliative care and daycare centre, and compared that with um, compared that with two other services that didn't have access to inpatient beds. And what the, what the obviously it's a huge document, but a couple of dissenting points is that access to inpatient beds um, leads to significant savings in hospital expenditure in the last three months of life. So it's way cheaper to look after a patient in the last three months of life if they're under palliative care. That's the last three months of life. And why is that? Because it reduces inappropriate admissions to hospitals, reduces the frequency of a &E presentations by 60 to 70%, and not because the patients are in the hospitals. I said this in another setting, and they were the same, it's not because the patient's in the hospital. I said, no, in the hospitals, no, it's not because of that. 90% of our care is given in the home, in the community. So it's not, it doesn't add up, it's not because they're in the hospitals. And furthermore, when they looked at the last year of life, they found that a fully resourced palliative care model with inpatient unit and daycare and home care was not over the last full year of life more expensive than standard care. So if you had a fully resourced hospital palliative care working uh, with standard health care, it wasn't more expensive than standard health care was just working on its own. Okay. It reduces hospital admissions. Um, it facilitated uh, patients to stay at home and it reduced a &E presentations. So they're powerful things that now evidence demonstrates. So, so far, we've, through the literature and the research, been able to demonstrate cost effectiveness of a full model of palliative care. We've been able to demonstrate the service benefits of a full model of palliative care. Really, you know, for us getting up in the morning, do we even think about that? We don't. What we think about are patients. So we have to be able to demonstrate the patient benefits of a full model of palliative care on an ongoing basis. So what we need is a simple fr framework that will enable us to prospectively monitor patient and care outcomes on an ongoing basis in a way that's unobtru unobtrusive to them. We can't hammer sick patients and families and always be asking questions, okay? So it has to be quite light from that perspective. And the reason to do that is that we can then benchmark across services so we can see what we're doing 
and in some way display what it is that we're doing to funding authorities, etc. And this has to be in a way that's um, helpful and non-threatening. If anything is introduced into a service, particularly if it's uh, not compulsory or voluntary, it is in any way potentially punitive. People simply won't sign up for it. And they're right not to really. There's enough kind of going on with, without having to deal with that. So it has to be something that's positive, proactive, and even in some way, God forbid, a little bit of fun. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a little while. What I've noticed over the years, though, is, as Norma said, I first kind of became interested in this area about 10 years ago. As I said, my, I have a bit of a background in an MBA and stuff like that, and I found there was a huge kind of emphasis in the private sector and the metrics and all that. And when I came back into the, into the healthcare sector, there was absolutely none. And I was going, my goodness, like, I mean, how, how is this place, even, how is the, the, the service even run? And what I've noticed over the years is a very significant ch changing mindset in palliative care. About 10 years ago, when I used to go up to um, palliative care practitioners and I mentioned quality and metrics, they'd immediately become suspicious. They'd kind of, kind of look at you and say, well, you know, of course, we can't really define what it is that we do, and how we do it, but we know that we do it well. You know, and even they're saying, of course, we can define what it is that we do and we have to be able to prove it if we're going to survive. So now what I find across the country is that there's a huge interest in it um, and there's willing participants and willing services everywhere to become engaged in this. And that's because I think people see the reason why we're doing it. We're doing it so that we can give more patients like that man that kind of care and being able to protect the resources to give that care on an ongoing basis. Some of the problems that we have um, are obviously huge IT and platform problems because there's no funding for it. And even if we did have funding for it, traditionally we've no standardized, me standardized metrics across services. So this is the framework that, um, that Norma actually alluded to earlier on. It's the Australian case mix classification uh, for, for palliative care. And it was developed by Cathy Eager in the early 2000s. Um, and it's an approach to, to quantify case mix complexity based on a patient's phase of illness, their functional status, their symptom scores, and their psychological and family distress. So quick, very, very short uh, talk about what these elements are. For anyone who doesn't know, phase of illness, there's five phases, stable, unstable, deteriorating, terminal, and bereaved. Stable is where the patient is stable. Unstable is where something new and unexpected has happened that requires a change in the plan. Deteriorating is a more expected uh, decline in the patient's status, terminal in the last few days, and then the, the brief phase. The model also looks at the functional status with two things, the resource utilization group of activity of daily living, that's what the patient actually does, and then the Australian Karnofsky's performance scale, which is what they're capable of doing. So that's zero to 100%, and the rug ADL looks at what the patient does on a daily basis, so bed mobility, toileting, transfer, and eating. It's a very good way of actually looking at what their real functional status is. They also use the thing called the palliative care problem severity score, which is a four item, zero to three rated scale, um, looking at pain, other symptoms, psychological and spiritual distress, and family and, and care and distress. And of course, there's huge problems with lumping all of the symptoms into one. Everyone's aware of that, but that's just the, way, the best way that they could approach this. Uh, it's actually proxy rated, uh, scores daily uh, and at phase change, and it's now advocated across all of Australia uh, for the routine assessment of, of palliative care patients. So in Milford, um, a number of years ago, I kind of had a, some dealings with, with David Currow. Uh, you know, I've been at a few talks and been very impressed by the work they were doing in Australia. So I wanted to see, if, without going too big, could we actually, could a model like this actually fly in Ireland in some way? So in Milford, I had a bit of an adaptation in this model to actually make it comply with some of the metrics we were, uh, we were using. I used the palliative performance scale, the problem severity score, and the phase of illness. And at the same time and on the same pages, uh, the patients, um, I, well, we looked at, uh, the, the nurses developed a, a, nurse, a nursing intensity tool to look at their intensity of nursing activity at the same time with the same patients. We collected uh, that on, by the way, I'm not going to go into this too much because lots of people have seen me present this before. So we looked at 400 patients, consecutive admissions over a six month period, and 43% of the patients when they came to us were in an unstable phase. And we followed those patients after that, 60.7% of those stabilized back to a stable phase within 48 hours, 
and 70% within 72 hours. And that is a significant resource implication because the difference in cost between an unstable a patient and a stable patient is enormous and they proved that in Australia. What's more is, and more pertinently, um, the pain experience and other symptoms all improved dramatically in a significant progressive and linear fashion after admission. So we're able to prove that, much like that man had experienced, but now we're actually demonstrating it. And the impact, uh, and also from a psychological perspective and a family and care perspective, the distress greatly improved after admission, as you expect, and in a significant progressive and linear fashion. And that's actually measuring all the things that that man was talking about in his little talk before this. From an efficiency perspective, the nurse's input actually was, was driven by patient need. So stable, unstable, deteriorating in terminal phases drove differing level, levels of nursing uh, interventions. And also that was a flexible response. So when a patient went from an unstable phase back to a stable phase, uh, there was an associated change in the intensity of nursing activity. People might say, well, wouldn't you just, not just the way it would be. Well, actually what actually was just proven there was technical efficiency in a healthcare setting. And that's the flexibility of resource input. So when you com combine that, that small study that we did with the evidence that's out there, and I've actually presented this to uh, some of our healthcare management over down in, um, in the Midwest, we stabilized 7% of unsta unstable patients within 72 hours. That is a huge cost, uh, impact on cost of care. We improved pain, symptoms, psychological distress, family and care distress significantly and progressively after admission, and we can prove it. We reduced a &E visits, we know from the SRI report, by six, uh, 60 to 70%. We provide 90% of our care days at home, and we greatly reduced the number of deaths in the hospital. Uh, we, in the Midwest, we run between 8 and 12% up and down, uh, compared to over 40% uh, nationally. So that shows that the hospice and community model is cost saving to the service and reduces uh, pressure on A&E and frees up hospital beds. And you see, lots of us in healthcare actually talk the language that that patient is talking, but this is the language that healthcare man management talk. So we have to play their game in a way. So overall, from the small study we did in Milford, we're able to demonstrate clinical effectiveness. That isn't say we do something good, we actually can prove it and we demonstrated clinical efficiency and proved it. So what was next then? Well, um, as Norma said, I did a senior fellowship in palliative medicine, which really what that was was a travel bursary to actually go abroad and look at what other countries are doing. And myself and Brian Creedon looked at uh, quality and performance. And we went over to the lady who developed this model in Wollongong, Australia, uh, Professor Cathy Eager. She's an extraordinary lady, very, very nice. Um, and all right, <laughs> okay, it's not that bad. Oh. Um, and uh, she was very nice, but she is one of these like gets up in the early in the morning, never sleeps type lady. So when she gave us our, our 10 day itinerary, she nearly killed us. So we were between, <laughs> we were between Sydney, Wollongong, Melbourne, and the Gold Coast, and back all within 10 days. Presentations, everything was full on, it was fabulous but exhausting. And what the peacock or the palliative of care outcome collaboration, as Norma said earlier on, and um, the purpose of the palliative care outcomes collaboration in Australia is to drive continuous quality improvement. That's why they exist. And they do it by providing continuous feedback to doctors, clinicians, nurses, and healthcare providers uh, on the outcomes of the care that they're giving. And they've data on over a quarter of a million patients uh, over the last 10 years. So that's powerful data that they use and they analyze and they assess. So what the PEACOC is, as it's called, is a it's a national program that utilizes standardized clinical assessment tools to measure and benchmark patient outcomes between services over time. And provides clinicians with these tools. So they're standardized tools that all services use the same tools uh, and they facilitate the routine uh, collection of data and they assess and analyze this data for the purpose of benchmarking. Um, and they give patient they give regular reports back on these patient outcomes, uh, and they uh, provide a number of workshops, two workshops a year, uh, which are actually focused on trying to make them positive, uh, almost fun and helpful. And there's no punitive and there's no financial um, 
I suppose, entity attached to this. So it's anonymous, voluntary, and a, a, a positive thing. It also, because they flat on so many patients in their longitudinal database, they support research there. So it's housed in the innovation campus in Wollongong. This is important. It's 90% competitive uh, funded. And that means these guys have to be on the game because if they're not producing meaningful results, they just disappear. Okay, so it's a very highly functioning place. That's it in, uh, in Wollongong. I know it looks good, but you know, like anything, you're really there. It's actually fabulous. It's really, really good. Okay. Um, but when you walk in the door, it's like, wow. And when you meet them, it's like, Australians are kind of relaxed. Like, these guys are on their game, but they do it in a kind of a, an open shirt, you know. Yeah, well, you know, but they actually get it all done brilliantly on time all the time. So they're tremendous work ethic. So the Australian Health Services and Research Institute, which the Peacock is part of that, um, their motto or their driving force is patient outcomes drive service development. Uh, and what they do is consistent root cause analysis in a positive and proactive way. If the outcomes are off for a service, what they do is they look at the processes that lead to the outcomes. And that's what you should do in quality. And they have quality improvement facilitators that go into organizations that aren't performing in a particular area to help improve that. And if they need a resource, they make, they make the case for that resource. Uh, if, there, if there's an education imperative there, they make sure that happens. That's called the peacock cycle, as uh, Norm said earlier on. And they provide regular benchmarking workshops focusing on improvement. The data between the services is completely confidential. No services identified. And they, uh, what they do is every six months, services are given a number, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the next six months, those numbers are scrambled again. So at any of the workshop, no one knows, no one knows which number the other service is. So it's, it's, it's anonymous that way. Um, and it's a given that, uh, that some services won't ever meet all the benchmarks, and initially, most services will, will meet none of the benchmarks. It's kind of a lag phase at the start. They call that the diagnostic phase. So the data they collect is like the case mix model, is the phase, the positive care problem severity score, the modified Karnofsky scale, the RUG ADL, and this thing that they developed called the symptom assessment scale. If you remember the positive care problem severity score, um, is proxy rated. The symptom assessment scale is patient rated. And it's a seven item uh, scale, zero to 10, measuring the seven most common symptoms and the, the stress that the patient is feeling with those symptoms. So often we find the worst scoring a patient's pain as seven out of 10 on the problem severity score. Um, or, or, the, or sorry, we scored, or sorry, it would be at a 10 on the problem severity score. It would be, let's say, moderate or severe, or two or three. And then when we actually measure the symptom assessment scale, they're saying they're distressed from that pain. It's like a one, you know? If I can, sorry. Um, and so this is what the sheet looks like. I was wondering why you're holding that up. Was they're saying, like, do you have a question? <laughs> Could you wait, wait for a minute? So five minutes, okay. That's what it looks like. I better motor. Uh, and they're called the palliative care vital signs and uh, the rate of one stadium. And, and this is, like, is something that is, um, is presented at every MDT. We're doing this in Milford now, it's very helpful, and at every patient uh, changeover. So the Peacock data is uh, submitted six monthly, they give reports and they, have, uh, and they have benchmarking workshops then. So here are some of the benchmarks. I'm not going to get into them because I actually look at them in a second again. So uh, time from date ready to episode start, time in the unstable phase, and they have a large number of, um, the large number of metrics around uh, symptoms, which is what obviously we should be doing. The posters they produce, they produce, produce service-wide posters that have, give demographic data, and also you know, the, where the episodes of care took place, many services actually reached the benchmarks or not. And then they give this, the individual services uh, large reports and uh, summary documents on how they're actually meeting each of the benchmarks. Green is good, orange not so good. Uh, these posters were all around Rubina Hospital on the Gold Coast. And um, I asked a nurse there, I said, what do you think of all these posters? And she said, uh, we're just trying to reduce the orange. And uh, I said, oh, that's great. So she laughed and I laughed. It was a beautiful moment. So, anyway. <laughs> so could we do this in Ireland? Yes, but we have severe IT problems. So more Brian than me did a kind of a, a charm offensive over there. And they said that we can use their IT platforms and their 15 resident sitting daily statisticians. I nearly fainted. Uh, they're happy to run our data. We collect it in Peacock format. It's called the Peacock Eye, Peacock in Ireland. Uh, and they're going to benchmark us internationally 
uh, and nationally when we get that data in. Does it help patients? Well, if you look at the growth of the peacock in the last number of years, it's grown exponentially. And the reason for that is, and I asked everybody this, is because if they're trying to manage their service and if they find that they're deficient in an, out in an outcome in a particular area, and if there is a resource deficit in that service, they strongly use this uh, from an equity basis to actually get that resource. So I'm not going to go through the, the trends and outcomes because I don't have time, but basically all the trends over time can be displayed to be improving towards the national benchmarks, things and like timely assessment of patients, patients in the unstable phase, patients' pain and other symptoms, all are improving. So what we have at the moment, and I'm just finishing up, is a collaborative pro a project which is just starting we in Milford have started submitting our data um, to Peacock for any GDPR people out there. It's uh, de-identified and unre-identifiable, so it's not pseudonymized, it's anonymized data, so it's GDPR compliant. Um, the Peacock platform took 20 minutes to upload onto our computer, uh, in which they gave us for free. Uh, for, it's called Epicenter, and uh, we're, we're just getting some feedback on the quality of our data. And there's seven sites in Ireland that are uh, coming on board to actually just try this. We didn't choose seven sites, people are contacting us. Anybody's welcome to be involved. So in conclusion, in the last 10 years, we've shown that e there's evidence supporting the efficiency of the palliative care model. There's evidence supporting the effectiveness of the palliative care model. And now we have a potential model that can use outcomes to drive service development going into, going into the future. And this is the initial trial period to see if that will work. And then hopefully this will enable us to support the case for expanding the palliative care model in Ireland and, get, and gaining resources for that. Thank you.